Welcome to Syntax, a Generative Introduction, 4th Edition. My name is Andrew Carney. I'm a professor of linguistics at the University of Arizona. I'm the author of your textbook, and I'll be leading you through this series of video tutorials. In the last video, we talked about how we can describe parts of speech in terms of their distribution, where they appear in a sentence, and what kinds of affixes they take. In this video, we're going to consider functional parts of speech, which are a little trickier to do. And in general, with functional parts of speech, we just have to list them or memorize them. But they allow us to also make generalizations about position in the sentence. Now, before we start in on um, looking at the kinds of definitions of different kinds of functional parts of speech, I want to make two pieces of um, terminology clear. The first one is the distinction between open and closed class parts of speech. Open class parts of speech allow neologisms, new words. Um, they typically express content, and they are typically the major categories, like nouns, verbs, adjectives, and adverbs. What I mean by open class is you can make up a new word with a new meaning, and uh, it fits right there into that part of speech. So, for example, I can make up a word sploit. And sploit refers to the fantastic sheen that shines off my forehead because I'm so bald. And I can talk about the sploit of my forehead. My, that's a fantastic sploit you have. That's an example of a new word that you've never heard before. And you can tell right away it's a noun. Now, by contrast to that, we have closed class parts of speech. Closed class parts of speech typically don't allow new additions. They often express function rather than content. And um, they are typically things like prepositions, conjunctions, modals, auxiliaries, determiners, pronouns, and other things. Now, closed class parts of speech don't have to be totally closed, but it's a very rare event when you add a new word to a closed class part of speech. So, for example, um, I could make up a, a preposition that I think would be really useful, which means to be both over and under something at the same time. Um, but nobody is ever going to pick up on that word. That be, and the reason they're not going to pick up on it is because it's a closed class part of speech. Similarly, we just don't make up new determiners. And we don't make up new complementizers. It does happen that new complementizers and determiners fall into the language, but it's exceedingly rare. Now, there's a closely related notion which is the relation of lexical versus functional. It's not the same as open versus closed, although there is a tight connection. Lexical parts of speech, which are almost always open class parts of speech, although there are some uh, exceptions to that, like pronouns, um, express the contentful or referential part of the meaning. They express the lexical items. Uh, so, for example, nouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs. One way to identify lexical parts of speech is they are often the items that are left um, when you speak telegraphically. Telegraphically uh, refers to the old um, telegrams and telegraphs that people used to send one another, where you would say things like, quick, send money now, emergency, where you leave off all the functional words and instead just use the lexical words. And the reason they used to do that was you got charged by the word, so you left off all the um, non-lexical, non-contentful parts. So those are lexical parts of speech. We can contrast those with functional parts of speech. Functional parts of speech um, typically are closed class, and they express the grammatical information in a sentence. So in a sense, they're the glue that holds the sentence together. So preposi prepositions and auxiliary constructions and complementizers and determiners, negation markers and conjunctions are all examples of functional parts of speech. Now, it turns out that there really is 
a mental difference between functional parts of speech and lexical ones. Um, I'm going to do a little experiment with you here. I'm going to flash up a little uh, a paragraph, and I want you to count the number of Fs in it. Okay, how many Fs did you count? Many people only count three. So many people will only see the F in finished files and scientific. But in fact, there are six. There's also the Fs in of. And for many people, although many of you, some of you may well have counted those, but for many people, they don't see the Fs when you have, when they're appearing in functional words. And this is because it seems like there is a distinction in the minds of people about those grammatical words and the lexical words. People concentrate more on the lexical words and the, gra and the functional words simply function to connect things together. Um, I'm going to do another little experiment with you. In the following, um, there's, um, there's a surprising thing that happens with certain uh, articles. See if you can spot it. Did you spot it? It's the fact that the word the is repeated at the end of the second line and at the beginning of the third. So the sentence actually reads, when people read prose, they often don't no notice that the, the definite article has been repeated. And again, it's repeated in the fourth and fifth lines. This is because they don't pay attention to the, the fact that the article is a functional category. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, let's talk about some closed class parts of speech, some, in, in particular, some functional categories. So prepositions are an example of uh, a closed class functional category. Um, these are words that relate uh, noun phrases either to verbs or to um, other nouns. Uh, examples are to, from, under, over, with, by, at, above, etc. Those are all prepositions. We, in linguistics, we indicate the preposition category with the abbreviation P. Another major class of functional items are the determiners, which we indicate with the letter D. So when you see D in a syntactic diagram, it stands for determiner. Now, D contains a whole bunch of different um, things. It contains articles. Those are words like the, a, uh, and an. Deictic articles, those are words like this, that, these, those, yawn. It includes quantifiers. These are things that tell you the quantity of something. So every, every, some, many, most, few, all, each, any, less, few, or no. Um, numerals, when they're used to count an, uh, a noun. So one book, two book, two books, three books, four books, etc. Also possessive pronouns my book, your book, his book, and also certain question words, which we call WH question words because they begin with the, letter, the letters WH, like which and whose. So as in which book or whose book. Those are all determiners. Um, the, the class is so defined because these items all appear in one specific, one specific slot within the noun phrase. Another uh, category of uh, functional items are the conjunctions. Conjunctions are uh, words that connect two like items together on sort of an equal basis. So for example, um, this book and that book, or red and blue. Um, also the or morpheme, uh, as in uh, six books or seven books. Those uh, are conjunctions that connect two items that are of equal importance. The next category, which we call complementizers, is probably new to you. Uh, in traditional grammar, they're called subordinating conjunctions. But in linguistics, we call them complementizers because they indicate that something is the complement to another. Complement being the accompaniment. Um, these are typically used for embedding one clause inside of another. A clause is a kind of sentence. So what you do is you take one sentence and you embed it inside of another. 
So uh, typical complementizers include that, like I said that Bill left, uh, if I asked if Bill left, I asked whether Bill left, I asked for Bill to leave. Those are all complementizers. Now this next category will definitely be new to you because it's unique to uh, generative grammar. It's the category we call tense. Now um, there's two senses of the word tense. One is about time. Right, so one is, one is about past, future, present. That's not what we're talking about here. This is a category about words that can indicate the um, morphological or semantic tense of the phrase. And they include all sorts of individual words. So I'm not talking about ed suffixes or s suffixes, the tense suffixes of English. I'm talking about these individual words. And typically, um, they're auxiliaries or modals. And then there's one special one, which is the non-finite uh, tense marker, too. So auxiliaries are words like um, has, as in he has gone. Um, modals are um, often appear in sort of the same position, although they have slightly different distributions. These are words like will, would, should, could, um, must. Those are all modals. And the special... Uh, non-finite tense marker too, as in he wants to leave, that to there. Those are all things that we're going to list as the category T in our tree structures when we start drawing them. And finally we have the negation category, which the perfect example of which is the word not. Note by the way the spelling of the word complementizer here. This is a complement, not a complement. It's not, it's not an I. We're not giving compliments to people. We are marking something as the complement to the other, as in complementarity. All right, to summarize, in this video, we've talked about um, a couple of distinctions in terminology. One is the difference between open and closed class parts of speech. Uh, this describes whether or not the part of speech allows new words or neologisms. Open class parts of speech do, closed class do not. This is tightly aligned, although not one-to-one, -one, with the distinction between lexical and functional parts of speech. Lexical parts of speech provide the contentful information in the sentence, and functional parts of speech provide the grammatical uh, information that ties the sentence together. Um, often it's the case that lexical parts of speech are open and functional parts of speech are closed, although that's not perfect. And then we ran through some common functional parts of speech like prepositions, determiners, complementizers, conjunctions, negations, and that new category you haven't heard before called tenses.